Right, let's get started. So good morning, everyone, or a good afternoon, good evening, if you're based in Europe or in Asia. Uh, welcome to the Central Asia Program Seminars. My name is Sebastian Perus. I'm a research professor working with Central Asia Program at the Institute for European, Russian and Eurasian Studies at George Washington uh, University. So we are going today to address uh, I would say surprisingly understudied, but so relevant and important topic, uh, uh, that is, which is shame or uyat in Kyrgyz and Kazakh, and which is a regulatory mechanism that constrains individuals' behaviors and encourages them to conform to the dominant social norms and which in Central Asian societies, and not only in Central Asian societies, of course, uh, remain uh, powerful. So uh, the presentation we will have today are based on chapters uh, which have been published in a volume uh, edited by Hélène Thibault and Jean-François Caron. Uh, the book is entitled Uyat and the Culture of Shame in Central Asia and has been published by Pelgrave Macmillan. And today, so we have on this panel, uh, first one of the editors, Ellen Thibault, and uh, five of uh, the book uh, contributors. Uh, so, and by the diversity of uh, their approach, uh, all uh, our participant panelists are going to look at the various forms of UYAD, the impact of UYAD on society, and also the reactions to UYAD, including support, but also resistance to it. So each speaker is going to present about between five and 10 minutes. After their presentation, we will have a Q&A session. So please feel free to send me your questions uh, uh, or to send them in the, in the chat box. Uh, I'm going first to give the floor to Hélène, who again is the editor of, uh, of the volume and will present briefly the volume before giving the floor to the contribu chapter contributors who are going uh, we're, yeah, we're going to give more details about what they were willing to do about the chapter. So uh, Hélène is uh, an associate professor in the Department of Political Science at Nazarbayev University and a member of the Political Economy uh, for Education Research Network. Her research focuses on the politics of Central Asia, as well as uh, gender and uh, religious uh, identities. So, uh, Ellen, the floor is yours. And thank you, everyone, very, very much for being with us today. Hélène, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Sebastien, and thank you uh, for the Central Asia program to, um, to host us uh, today. Um, I'm very happy to present uh, this, this edited volume. Uh, it was great collaborative work. Um, I'm just going to share a few slides. I'll speak very briefly just to introduce uh, the book um, briefly uh, and um, the series as well. Um, so this is part of um, uh, the, the Step and Beyond uh, series on Central Asia. Um, and uh, so Jean-Francois Caron um, is the director of this uh, collection, uh, but, um, and he edits uh, quite a lot of books. <laughs> but I, I want to mention that um, everyone can actually submit uh, a book proposal uh, for this series um, um, and be the, uh, the, the, their own editor whether it be a monograph or an edited volume. Uh, and I'm also happy to present that, uh, to mention that the book, uh, our editor tr trusted us uh, enough to uh, make a translation into German and which will be released probably by the end of this year. Um, so that being said, um, our book uh, is a, um, um, a collaborative work, interdisciplinary. I'm a political scientist. Some of us are uh, sociologists. Um, but not all of the authors are actually scholars working in academia. We also have activists and teachers, uh, which also I, I'm quite happy about um, this kind of collaborative work. Uh, everyone is from Central Asia or living in Central Asia. Um, uh, and um, I think um, the book, uh, I've seen uh, already some criticism online uh, about um, uh, the idea that we were essentializing, uh, essentializing, yeah, um, the uh, Central Asian cultures, but I think readers will find that the book um, uh, proposes a quite nuanced uh, 
understanding of Uyat uh, in light of contemporary economic and political conditions. Um, and uh, as you will see, one of the chapters uh, written by K Moldir um, Kabilova uh, is uh, actually arguing that the culture of Uyat is declining in Central Asia. Um, so, um, and um, we also wanted to um, um, emphasize that although most of the papers deal with uh, issues related to gender, it's not limited to that. Uh, my uh, chapter is not, Jean-Francois' chapter is not. Um, and we had one collaborator who um, abandoned the project uh, for, um, the, for, for some reasons, uh, who was also um, dealing with the economy um, uh, in Kyrgyzstan. Um, but um, so it's not limited to gender, although it has a very strong gender uh, aspect to it. Uh, and I don't like puns uh, very much, but I couldn't help making this one. So it's really a shame that we did not include that. So that is one of my biggest regrets about this book that it doesn't include um, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan. We actually haven't received uh, proposals for those countries. Um, and I think this will be um, the, um, a good case for uh, a second Uyat book, Uyak Dva. <laughs> We had to do. Um, so, um, so I'm looking forward uh, to this uh, to this presentation, um, to and and for a conversation with our participants. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, and as a follow note, um, I wanted to mention that today is my mother's birthday, and I wish her bon fête, mama. <laughs> so I'll stop here. <laughs> Sorry, I was muted. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, and for uh, for your for your words uh, for this uh, short book pre uh, presentation of the of the book. So now we're going to uh, give the floor to uh, the contributors, and we will start with Carly uh, Gash Kabatova. Carly uh, Gash is a researcher and advocate for youth sexuality education in Astana and Washington DC, and in this book she addresses. How yet undermines youth sexual literacy in Kazakhstan. Kaligash, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sebastian, and thank you to all the organizers for this event. I'm very happy to be here and to be among the contributors to this book. So, yes, as Sebastian said, I've been researching um, access of Kazakhstan youth to comprehensive sexuality education in Kazakhstan since 2017. But when I did my study in 2019, I realized that it's actually not only about access to good quality information and resources, but also about the capacity of young people to process that information, to look for that information and to process it. And I will just briefly mention that I advocate for uh, comprehensive sexuality education to be included in uh, school curricula in Kazakhstan or anywhere in the world because it is so important. And uh, yeah, I will not go into the details a lot, but research shows that young people who are exposed to comprehensive sexuality education, which covers like learning about relationships, healthy relationships and detecting unhealthy relationships and learning about human development and protecting your sexual and reproductive health, uh, all these skills and knowledge, they equip young people with uh, uh, or uh, empower young people to make more informed decisions about their present time and future to protect again themselves, their sexual and reproductive health, their future education, their possibilities and family planning. And that information, of course, is supposed to be uh, scientific and not like based on some uh, biases or personal convictions of people. So uh, moving forward to this chapter, uh, I did the study in 2019 and for this chapter is focused on uh, relationship between this culture of yacht and uh, gender socialization of young people and their capacity to learn and process information about sexual and reproductive health and rights. So when I started that uh, study in 2019, um, I started it because I wanted to uh, see if there is actually a demand among young people and parents in Kazakhstan for sexuality education. So I wanted to know if there is a demand, then 
in which form young people want to receive that education? Do they want it in school? From what age? What topics should it cover? And who should teach it? And all the same questions for parents. And um, among the most striking findings or observations was, uh, again, um, like because I believe that language, the language that we use to interact with the world, it constructs our reality and understanding of the world. And be, uh, I'm, I will go back to the methodology. So the methodology of that study was focus groups. Uh, that was the main research method. And I conducted a focus group with parents of teenagers and with teenagers in five different cities of Kazakhstan, just to see how it um, differs how the views and opinions differs, differ depending on the region of Kazakhstan. And those teenagers and parents were not related, of course. So um, the two most striking findings that I uh, emphasize in this chapter is that um, the language plays a large role. And I observed that young people whose main language is Kazakh, meaning that they speak Kazakh in the, inside of the family and they study in Kazakh, they are less likely to ask questions. Well, first of all, they have much more hierarchical relationships in their families with their parents. And they're like more kind of um, like they're on the lower rank in the family. So they don't question decisions. They don't ask much questions or they, but of course, these are only observations from observations from my focus groups. They are much less likely to ask questions about sexuality or even puberty uh, to their parents, and they are they feel ashamed of being even interested in the, uh, the topics of sexuality or any like body or growing up like puberty and everything related to that, like personal relationships, romantic relationships, compared to those young people who are bilingual or Russian speakers. And the same with the parents and uh, the parents who grew up in the uh, Kazakh speaking environment and were raising their families in the same way, they were much more stricter and they've, they are, instilling this uh, notion that sex is bad, dirty, and shameful, and nothing to be proud of. And several parents even said it in the focus groups. So because of all of that, uh, young people are um, less knowledgeable about their own bodies, about their rights and how to protect themselves. And um, the second, uh, it is not like a striking finding because we know that gender plays a large role, but depending on the gender of young people, they receive very different messages from the society surrounding them and from their parents and culture. Like if it's a boy, then what he hears is that if he's going out, then it's like, um, be careful or take a condom, take a rubber. And what girls are told, it's like, uh, don't go out alone. Don't go outside after 9 p.m. Don't like have your hair loose. Don't dress in like, don't wear tight clothes. Don't wear short clothes. Don't go uh, to parties or don't get too close to boys. Don't be friends with boys. So all these restrictions are put on girls. And of course, uh, responsibility, uh, the share of responsibility put on girls and females is much larger than that would that is put on boys or men, uh, even though those who commit like sexual violence, sexualized violence or gender-based violence are most often males against females. So in parents, uh, uh, they form it, like they are trying to protect the girls, but what they're doing is they're putting all the responsibility on the girls. Uh, so these are two main findings, and I don't want to be too long. I, I think it's more interesting to actually discuss at the Q&A session. So my main conclusion is that um, we always need to take into account the culture, and actually not just take into account when we develop programs on sexuality education or any other programs, developmental programs, we always should root them in the local culture. 
Um, so, because very often, uh, because I'm myself an activist and I have a website uh, dedicated to youth sexuality education for young people and parents in Kazakh and Russian, and we have a chatbot, a span, which is also into languages. Even though we ourselves are doing it, we translate the materials from Russian or English into Kazakh. But actually, what we should do is we should develop materials from scratch in the language in which we want young people to consume it and to process it. So yes, that would be my conclusion. And thanks again for letting me speak about my chapter. You're more than welcome, Kelly Gash. Thank you very much for your, for your presentation. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Moldir Kabilova. Uh, Moldir is a PhD candidate in social policy at University of Nottingham. Uh, research focuses on women's employment, welfare state, culture, and gender, and she holds a master's degree from the University of, of York. And in the book, in this volume, she addresses the process of de-shaming in Kazakhstan. Moldir, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Can you see my slide? Um, hello, dear colleagues and audience. Let me present you the chapter named Yatemiz or the process of the shaming in Kazakhstan. I would like you, I would like to thank editors of the book, Helen and Francois, for their hard work in putting the book together. In this chapter, I argue that Kazakhstan is going through the tradition the traditionalization process. And this phenomenon is underestimated as a result of a more popular discourse on re-traditionalization. The academia exotifies Central Asia and focuses on exacerbation and reinforcement of national traditions. Moreover, the media draws attention to exceptional yacht cases, which creates public resonance and do not uh, represent perceptions of the majority in Kazakhstan. Uh, Detraditionalization is the decline in belief and practice of the existing traditions passed on from previous generations. This research aims to study the role of shame culture, known as yacht, in people's decision-making process in Kazakhstan. Lessening significance of the yacht cultural code might serve as an indicator of the detraditionalization. The research applied online questionnaire that was completed by 607 respondents aged between 18 and 70 from 20 cities of Kazakhstan. Uh, so can you see me changing the slides? Yes, okay, thank you. Uh, there were five hypotheses tested with the help of the survey. The first hypothesis states that uh, the majority of people in Kazakhstan are indifferent to acts that are non-compliant with the yard cultural code taking place outside of the family circle. According to the results, more than 60% of the respondents did not agree that the lover's monument offends the honor of Kazakh women, within which 30% of them chose that art should be given more freedom, and 35% that the case, this case is exaggerated. The rest, 30% only of the respondents choose the option that the monument dishonored the reputation of Kazakh women. The second hypothesis states, uh, that people in Kazakhstan prioritize individual and family interests over the community expectations set within the Yacht Cultural Code. When asked if children's decision not to have a wedding ceremony would make them feel uncomfortable in public's eyes, more than half of them answered that they would allow their children to freely choose. Uh, the 30% would agree uh, with a children's decision if the money was spent on big causes such as the purchase of a house or investment in a business. The minority, the 10%, would disagree and believed that this custom of holding wedding ceremony for family and relatives had to be followed. Uh, with the statement, today people should not depend on public opinion, everyone has the right to do what he she wants even if others do not like, Less than 50% agree, as long as laws are not breached. 20% also agreed by choosing the answer, public opinion and laws should not restrict a person's ability to make decisions. Only the 3% of the respondents believe that the interests and opinion of society are above in individual's wishes. 
Uh, the respondents were also asked if the feeling of fear of disappointing others and the desire to avoid public condemnation is an important part of Kazakh culture and should be a guide in decision making. More than 40% disagreed, stating that it is an outdated concept and people should be guided by laws only. Uh, the rest, 20% uh, agreed that this Kazakh culture of meeting community expectations should be preserved. Uh, hypothesis number three states that people are less willing to comply with the Yacht cultural code if it requires going against the law and puts the safety of, of self and society at risk. Uh, more than 60% would uh, choose to abstain from going to the event during the pandemic, within which uh, the 35% said that the safety is first and 30% that they felt uncomfortable with the host but still refused to attend whereas the rest 30% would still go, within which 15% feel guilty for breaking the law and the rest 20% just wanted to enjoy life. So hypothesis number four states, Kazakhstan people who experienced living abroad are less likely to be influenced by the Yacht Cultural Code than their compatriots who have not left the country of Kazakhstan because globalization and mobility contribute to detraditionalization. So 70% with foreign experience chose uh, option of would feel socially comfortable if their children did not have a wedding. As we can see, there is a drastic change between those who have experience of living abroad and those who do not. So hypothesis number five, the last hypothesis states has not been proven, which is residents of densely populated cities are more likely to make individualistic decisions that prioritize um, interests of individuals over the interests of the community dictated by the Yacht Cultural Code in comparison with the people living in less populated cities of Kazakhstan. Respondents were from more than 20 cities, among which majority were from Almaty, Nur Sultan and Shemkent, that is the cities of the Republic's significance. Uh, the Shemkent respondents are more likely to show a preference for following social norms and prioritizing collectivism over individualism in comparison with the big city for cities of Almaty and Nur Sultan. Population size and urbanization level do not have an impact on the pre uh, residents' perceptions of the Yacht cultural code. So moving on to the conclusion. Weakening influence of the Yacht cultural code on the decision-making process signifies the ongoing detraditionalization process as a result of the individualization. It contradicts the research works on rising re-traditionalization process in Central Asian countries, including Kazakhstan. The majority of people who participated in the survey chose answers that prioritized individual choice over community interests. They also chose personal safety, well-being, and comfort. The survey results demonstrated independence from public opinion and a willingness to go against social norms and traditions in cases of risks to one's safety and well-being. Uh, so the last point, age experiences of living abroad and the location of the city the respondents were from played a decisive role in their perception of the Yacht Cultural Code. Respondents at the age of 40 who spent time outside of Kazakhstan and majority of those coming from the eastern and, no and northern regions were more likely to demonstrate divine conduct and independence in replies. So as a final note, I would like to play this uh, short excerpt from the uh, music clip by the popular young rapper singer Yenglik. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Thank you so much, my dear. So uh, our next speaker uh, it will be Jibek and Jibaeva. Uh, Jibek is a primary school and middle school counselor at Bishkek International School. And in this few volume, uh, she wrote, she co-authored a chapter on the practice of Nebere Alu in Kyrgyzstan, uh, meaning take a grandchild, which is a tradition according to which new grandparents will adopt their son's firstborn child and raise, uh, raise him had, or her had. As uh, uh, his or her or youngest child. So, Jibek, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sebastian. And thank you for uh, organizers and Helen for this uh, book and contributors and audience for being here. And uh, first, uh, to start with, I think I need to explain this tradition. What is uh, what is it about and how it is uh, lived here? Uh, basically, Nebiralu is like when 
grandparents take their first grandchild to themselves as if it's their own like youngest child so they raise it as their own child and they give like uh, even they do change like documents and this child uh, child call uh his or her own parents as uh baike and jenge which means like uh, brother and sister-in-law uh, what was that called <laughs> i i forgot so a uh, brother and like a brother's wife so yeah basically uh but uh in context of history uh like um sociologists and uh, uh other scientists anthropologists explain it as if like it was a uh, really beneficial uh tradition before in history because like uh early um, in that age uh like people were used to get er married early like at the age of 13 and 14 and like women couldn't like uh, that girl is like own uh, is a kid and she couldn't care, take care of her own child and they were just uh, giving that child to their grandparents so that they have more experience in raising a child and they would take better care of the child but nowadays uh, most of the girls uh, get married in like uh, 20 or uh, like 30 at the, the 20s or 30s and we don't i think we don't need this tradition and there is no there is not much literature on this um uh topic and it was uh, kind of really hard uh, to do this um uh research uh, because uh, it is the first research in kyrgyzstan made uh, on this topic uh, i could find other literature in, about korea kazakhstan about like some western african countries because they also have this tradition but uh, regarding in kyrgyzstan we have nothing so it was the first uh, research on this topic and it was like quite hard to make it all uh, together and basically i did a qualitative research uh, and like i took a six in-depth interviews and based on them i was uh, making some uh, research and some uh, great findings about it that uh, most of the time this uh, woman uh, except this culture except this tradition because of the uyat because like uh, uyat or fear of being shamed isolated from their families aversion to the confrontations motivated our informants to accept the Biralu as a part of their marriage because like if they don't accept it like they can just kick it out from their families they are just uh, told like yeah you can just uh, go we just need you for the, uh, giving the birth and like uh, we don't need you so uh, that was the case and uh, sometimes like uh, respondents knew that they are going to give their first uh, child to their grandparents uh, because they talk about it before marriage and they accept that and as it is a, a tradition they don't have any other like uh, choice let's say and the thing is nowadays uh, this tradition is uh lived in some areas of Kyrgyzstan and in some uh it's not practiced at all so when there is a mix of regional <laughs> marriages it's really hard for other girls who are from different religion and they come to the region where it is practiced and they're like why you are doing this one and the answer is like it is a status for grandparents like if that grandmother have a grandchild with themselves it is like shows their status like it is their achievement for their lifetime and as you might know or you don't know i don't know so the thing is like in our patriarch patriarchal uh, culture uh the thing is like women only can get uh, some power when she becomes a grandmother most of the time when she like uh, marries her own children and when she becomes grandmother and when that uh, woman has a grandchild with next to them it's like a status and that's why they don't want to uh, give away that grandchild to their own parents <laughs> and uh, that's why it's kind of really related this uh, in terms of that it is related to 
grandmother as well because if she doesn't have grandchild next to her it's like we are and if she does if like uh, that uh, bride doesn't give uh, her own child to your grandparent it's also yet like you cannot do that are you like a oh, Kyrgyz woman you have to like uh, respect our culture you have to uh, be one of us uh, otherwise you are going to be isolated and there is a really big uh, cognitive dissonance uh, in those uh, mothers because they have um, like two choices either you are going to be good mother or you are going to be a good kilin so kilin is a bright uh, and daughter-in-law so uh, if you take care of your own child you are really bad kilin you're bad uh, daughter-in-law because you're not giving your uh, uh, child right but if you uh, don't give your child then it means uh, if you give your child it means like you are good daughter-in-law you are accepted by the uh, society you are accepted by your new family but you are becoming bad mother and this uh, cognitive dissonance is always like there and uh, they have really kind of difficult situation to a cold visit but most of the uh, uh this um respondents find uh, coping mechanisms such as like calling often to their child like uh now we have like cell phones video calling they do video calling but i also had some respondents who are like uh 60 70 years old and they were not allowed to call their uh, children and when they come to visit their own child they were like uh, don't visit too often because like if you visit too often your uh, child then they will remember they will miss and for the benefit of the child they try not to uh, visit too often so that uh, children can forget easily themselves so it's really hard uh, to it's really hard like a uh, mom and child uh, connection in this term and uh yeah um, also like uh, there is another thing like uh this uh, grandparents take their uh, grandchild um, because it is a guarantee that their own children will take care of them for example like you are going to take care of your own child which means you are going to come back to me and take care of me so uh it's also about feeling safe because like there will be somebody who will take care of you. And yes, it's about my chapter and let's do more in discussion part. Thank you for your uh, time. And I will not take much longer. <laughs> It's okay, Jivek, but yeah, okay, so thank you. Thank you very much for, for, for this presentation. Uh, we, uh, Elena Kim, uh, who actually co-authors uh, this chapter with Jibek, uh, couldn't be, can be with us today, but uh, Jibek, I mean, presented uh, her chapter very well, and we can, of course, discuss more about that, as uh, Jibek said in the Q&A session. So, our next speaker uh, is Maria Levitanus, who is a lecturer at the School of Health and Social Science at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, Maria received a doctorate in psychotherapy from the University of Edinburgh in 2020, uh, and her previous and upcoming publications uh, focus on the role of, uh, Soviet, of Soviet discourses in the narratives of queer people in Kazakhstan, queer immigration and queer activism in Kazakhstan and Russia. And in this volume, uh, Maria uh, elaborates on the culture of shame in the regulation of queer and subjectivities in Kazakhstan and forms of resistance against it. So thank you, Maria, for being with us, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sebastian and Central Asian Program, and of course, Helen, Jean-Francois, and all the collaborators for this great opportunity. I'll try to be quite brief um, in talking about my chapter. Um, as uh, Sebastian just pointed out, my aim there was to examine the role of the culture of shame or uyat in regulating the lives of queer people, but I also explored the ways in which queer people resist this cultural code. 
This chapter is based on uh, in-depth interviews with 11 people uh, aged between 20 and 45 at the time of the research. Um, and the, all the interviews were conducted in November 2017 in three cities, Almaty, Astana and Karaganda, uh, as part of my doctoral research. And the focus of my doctoral research wasn't necessarily on Uyad. It was, um, I looked at the everyday lives of queer people in Kazakhstan. Um, you will see in my chapter that I use uh, reflexive stance, um, and there I discuss my own <clears throat> apologies experience of growing up as a queer person in Kazakhstan, as well as other identities that I inhabit and biases in the context of my research. So the main themes that I identified consisted of the following. Uh, one of the central themes was silence around sexuality. So beginning from childhood, where there is no such thing as sexuality or queerness, uh, these topics are uh, subject to taboo, according to my participants. As one of the participants notes, there is, wasn't such a thing as being gay, and generally sex and sexuality are not discussed at school. Similarly, in Kazakh families, conversations about sex, relationships outside of marriage were not common, according to participants in my studies. However, it is unclear whether the silence that participants in the study point out uh, to um, and are describing is, can be attributed to the Soviet taboo or Kazakh uh, in relation to talking about relationships, as some uh, participants in my study pointed out, that maybe that shame or that silence has to do with their parents being brought up in Soviet Union or being of uh, Soviet, Soviet forged, I translated it, Sovetsky Zakalki in Russian. Um, it is also possible that the two silences sort of intertwine and uh, amplify one another. One of the uh, themes that emerging from the interview specifically with Kazakh participants was the extent to which extended families were involved in the process of regulating their queer family members' lives. And this is consistent with the existing literature on the centrality of family and more extensive networks of kin and Kazakh. Um, for Kazakh people, as well as regulatory power of the extended families uh, in Central Asia, which encompasses many aspects of people's lives, but um, and includes sexuality in particular. This idea falls in line with the honor and shame system, where it is uh, the visibility of deviance that bears repercussions specifically. So um, above all the image, um, and uh, it needs to be preserved. And apart from the actual violation of the norms, the violation that is made public is important in, reg in regulating. So the narratives of participants of the study show that silencing, making invisible, avoiding any acknowledgement or discussion of sexual or gender nonconformity um, are some of the crucial strategies to retain the honor within the family and the wider community for the families of queer people in Kazakhstan. I also speak about the effects of internalization of shame. So um, I term it turning, turning away from oneself. I think the narrative of Amir, uh, participant, uh, or participant's name, of course, are anonymized, and this is a, a pseudonym, um, is particularly poignant there. Um, Amir uh, speaks about uh, his friend who um, just the day before the interview uh, took their life. And um, indeed, as Macross uh, explains, suicide is a logical solution to the continuous experience of shame and to the impossibility of reclaiming or achieving the sense of social place within society. Um, this taps into quite an under-researched topic of um, what does shame, what role shame plays in queer suicides in Kazakhstan, um, and um, how does it actually imprint and affect people's lives. However, the effect of shame and reactions to it are not univocal amongst participants in the study, exposing the ambivalent nature of shame, moving away from the essentialist view of shame as something negative, and in fact, offering a productive conception of shame. So shame or uyat can serve a function of effectively uniting those who are marginalized um, in their recognition of each other's shared experience. The importance of being open and sharing and being an activist came up in the narratives of participants in this study. 
I also emphasize that shame has a fundamentally relational aspect to it, which reflect that uyat is an essential effect of intersubjective life. And really it reveals that others matter to us. When we feel um, uyat, when we feel shamed, or that means that stakes and interest in the other are exposed and our vulner vulnerabilities become visible. And this can explain why families go such a long way to control their queer children, sisters, and brothers and cousins. Um, and from this, right, uh, from this lens, the uyat can be interpreted as an enactment of care. So in my application of the concept of uyat in this chapter, I follow Diana Kudaybergenova, who argues that in the context of Kazakhstan, uyat serves a function of retraditionalization that sets to control heterosexual, um, to control and uh, reinforce heterosexual norms and punish any deviance uh, or uh, non-heteronormative behavior. I argue that the local concept of uyat serves a norm setting function that is not unique to the context of Kazakhstan or Central Asia. Uyat is one of many tools used in Kazakhstan to regulate deviance uh, and act to maintain that traditional, quote unquote, heteronormative order. Lastly, I suggest that uyat is not only a regulatory discourse, but also a discourse of resistance. Even though queer Kazakhstani people might not choose to be open about their identities, they might be controlled and their visibility might be regulated by shame or uyat. The fact that they keep living within heteronormative environments and connecting with their family members and communities means that those relationships, those environments, and even the shame and shaming themselves are being queered. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, thank you so much, Maria. So now we're, we're going to move to our last speaker, Hélène. Uh, Hélène Thibault, I already introduced her in, uh, at the beginning of this event, but uh, uh, let me repeat that Hélène is an associate professor in the Department of Political Science at Nazarbayev University. And so Hélène was the editor uh, with uh, Mr. Caron uh, of this volume, and she also wrote a chapter uh, entitled Shaming as a Form of Political Accountability in Kazakhstani Politics. So Hélène, the floor is yours. Thank you. Am I? Uh, no, I'm not muted. Okay. Uh, well, thank, uh, welcome back. Um, uh, thanks again for, for participating uh, and to all the collaborators and the Central Asia program. Um, so this topic, um, so as, as a, I normally write about gender um, in Central Asia, I mean, in the last two years I did, um, and we wanted to diversify a little bit. So I was thinking about what topic, non-gender topic to explore um, for, this, uh, for this volume. Um, and then I came on uh, um, those kind of messages as, as I live in Kazakhstan. Uh, I've been living in Kazakhstan for a few years. I, I, I read Kazakhstani media uh, quite a lot. Um, and I was very surprised to see um, the, some of the speeches from Nazabayev that um, are very harsh towards um, other politicians and uh, very surprising. Um, and I actually censored uh, some of those words because <laughs> it's quite coarse language. And as you can see from the photo, uh, he's not impressed. Um, so I was thinking, so he was um, basically uh, shaming politicians. In this case, he was talking to the mayor of Astana um, prior to the, uh, the, the expo in 2017 and complaining that the work is not going fast enough and the, the capital city is not developing as fast as it should. Uh, and the language is used is quite coarse, um, but it's also the tone is quite uh, infantilizing, uh, and the the pronoun te, yeah, is used um, instead of vui, which is the most more polite form to address a grown up person, uh, a man in a position like being the mayor of Astana. So I was uh, interested in uh, exploring uh, this phenomenon. <clears throat> so why, is, what is the role of shaming in, in politics in Kazakhstan? Um, so of course, the easy answer would be, um, um, it's uh, connected to Nazarbayev's personality, dominant personality, yeah? Uh, but, um, and that may, might be a part of the answer, but um, I was also surprised to see that um, other very high uh, level politicians also use uh, this kind of um, th those kind of uh, speeches and, and and address other politicians like that, such as 
Norlan uh, Nick, um, Nick Mullin, um, former uh, Speaker of Senate um, of the Majlis. Uh, so I will uh, talk about him in a moment. But um, so it's not only Nazarbayev. Yeah, it, it was. And so my chapter is mostly about Nazarbayev because actually uh, the current president Tokayev doesn't use this kind of rhetoric, uh, harsh language towards um, uh, towards um, other politicians so much, um, but. Um, but again, Nazarbayev was not the only one doing that. So the easy answer, of course, is uh, obvious answer is to assert dominance, yeah, the dominance of political actors. So by talking to this to uh, ministers and members of the government, Nazarbayev is really asserting its power over them and its dominant position. Um, but I, in the in the chapter, I argue that it's more complex than that. It's not only about asserting dominance; it's also about a way for the government to acknowledge uh, its inadequacies and its poor performance while keeping face. So Nazarbayev is acknowledging that they are problems, that the government is not doing um, exactly uh, an, an excellent work. He's criticizing his own government. So I was really uh, interested in that and as a way um, of yeah, recognizing, recognizing inadequacies, but also keeping face. But it's also, um, so it's as if Nazarbayev was speaking on the behalf of the population and blaming others for the government's poor performance. Um, and it's, it's actually, uh, we can see this as a performance because when those things happen, so the, the quote I was mentioning earlier that we saw in the previous slide um, was, um, uh, was televised and this was on television. So it's very public. Um, and um, what I found interesting is that these moments, uh, when, when those things happen, um, it creates a, it, it generates laughter, so people laugh, but even the person being shamed sometimes also laughs, so it feels like a performance. Um, and I also looked at uh, not only high profile politicians, but also um, cases that involved low ranking politicians or state administrators. Um, and but one thing I forgot to mention is that uh, there are patterns, there are differences between how people are shamed. High profile politicians are shamed, but they are not fired. They don't lose their positions. Uh, they, they remain in their own position. Yeah. Whereas low ranking politicians, when they are shamed because of media leaks most of the time, uh, they will be replaced. So this is a way probably to, uh, by other political actors, to get rid of either incompetent uh, uh, administrators or politicians, or <clears throat> to um, get rid of um, opponents, yeah, uh, competitors, for instance. Uh, so I looked at 30 cases that include public officials, um, uh, public shaming, like <clears throat> televised ones, and uh, media leaks. Um, so uh, I'll go very quick on this. So I think. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm arguing that this is in the context that these techniques are used as because there's limited accountability, political accountability, because of the dominance of Amanat, uh, recently renamed Amanat, yeah, Nurotan party. Uh, parliamentary, parliamentary elections are uh, proportional representation where um, voters have very little um, control over who is elected in parliament and there's great uh, elite reshuffling so there's not a lot of and um, mayors um, of large cities are not even elected um, so there's very little from the public as well little like uh, limited accountability um, so this is uh, one example yeah Nick Matulin um, who was uh, talking to the minister of ecology uh, this was in 2018 if I recall um, and um, so that's another example, yeah, saying, telling him that uh, the program, um, the reform, agricultural reform he proposed was ridiculous and that he should go to a village and learn how to make the difference between a cow and a chicken. Uh, so a very infantilizing kind of uh, language here. Um, so these are little uh, small scandals that involve low rank officials um, that uh, during uh, the quarantine, for instance, uh, some um, members of the anti-corruption agency were found in a sauna, whereas saunas should be closed. And this was leaked to the media. So the police filmed them and the police released this footage. So we can think of in Kazakhstan because there is well limited uh, freedom of, of, uh, of the press that these are vetted, yeah, vetted discourses that leak through the, uh, through the um, 
um, through the media that are meant to again sideline um, sideline um, uh, politicians, uh, rather incompetent or again uh, undesirable or uh, for political reasons. Uh, there was another case where Tokayev reacted um, about uh, the ex chairman of Board of Social Health. Uh, his wife was posting quite um, uh, many photos of their lavish lifestyle. It created criticism. Um, and um, so Tokayev reacted and they, these people were dismissed, unlike the high profile politicians that are normally not dismissed. So the, the, this, um, when the, the Minister of Ecology, he was replaced much later, uh, but not necessarily immediately after that. So they are sheltered, yeah? They are criticized, publicly shamed, but sheltered from actual punishment, but low rankings are not. And finally, I want to bring your attention to a very bizarre case um, that I, I use as a conclusion, as a form of, uh, I, I call it democratization of shaming that we have seen in the media, very bizarre. So I'm, I have to give you context here. So this is a photo um, on the top. So you see a black man holding this uh, this sign uh, written in Russian saying uh, to this, the mayor of Simei, the city of Simei, um, uh, that he has the most beautiful mustache. Yeah, so it's very, it's quite ridiculous. Uh, it's, it's absurd. Uh, and this, uh, uh, this message, the, so it's from a page, uh, Instagram page called Privyet is Afriki, hello from Africa, uh, that people, from all around the world, anybody. They cater for the Russian speaking public for some reason. Uh, and we don't know where they are. They don't mention it on their Instagram page, but you can pay them to have to uh, perform uh, dances um, and, and write something. You can print, uh, they can print somebody's photos. It's quite popular with birthday wishes. Um, and for some reason, the Kazakhstani public is using them also to pass on um uh political messages so after they presented so they're dancing it's a still yeah it's not a only a photo after they they, they present this sign with uh congratulating uh the akim the the mayor for for his uh, beautiful mustache uh they are dancing to a song kazakhstani song from irina kairatovna which is uh the the song 5000 um, which is uh, what made a sensation. It's quite popular band in Kazakhstan, but this song and especially the video is denouncing corruption. So there was a political message here. And here we have one, somebody paid them again uh, to denounce what was uh, happening here in, in the capital Astana. Uh, Mali Taldikol is a very close from the university here, uh, um, a lake that was drained uh, from, of, of uh, I mean, that was drained to make place for a residential complex. So we don't know who is commissioning those those things, but they are. Uh, and that's a way I'm saying as a for the public to use shame as a form of uh, voice as voicing their oppositions. Yeah. So it's a it's an easy uh, risk free way of, of shaming politicians. So this is a finally another case from Akhtau. Uh, the mayor of Akhtau um, commissioned um, uh, plastic tulips that cost a lot of money and all melted away because it's too hot in Aktau. Uh, so there was uh, this idea. So I'm, I'm interested uh, in pursuing this research and in, in, in seeing if this will become a tool for the civil society to also yeah, shame politicians. So I'll stop here and then I'll be happy to have a discussion um, afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hélène. So uh, yes, I mean, so our panel is to address uh, many questions I mentioned of UYAT, including reactions to it, including resistance. And I have received many, many questions. So we have about 20 minutes for, for, for discussion. And I will start with some specific questions uh, asked to uh, Moldir. So Moldir, uh, could you please share how you, uh, in your chapter, you define the social norms. And the second question is, did you analyze the relationship between the age of your interviewees and their responses and whether their responses varied based on their age? Um, thank you very much. Is it a question, the last question? Because I have a few questions which I have already replied uh, by typing. 
Is it okay, the last but I mean, if you could just maybe briefly still answer these two questions so um, the yes. rest of the audience could, uh, could hear you. Of course, there is a correlation between the age and the uh, responses that the, resp uh, that the people in the survey gave me. So I think the people, uh, so the strongest opposition to the shame culture was shown by people between the age of 18 and 24. And then again, between the 24, 25 and 35. So I have, um, obviously due to, due to the world limitations, I couldn't elaborate more in detail about the age factor, but I can send the, I can send the document uh, in the PDF format to that person, uh, Alia Oljaeva. So if you could just type your working email, please, I can send you. So obviously there is a correlation, yes, yes, thank you. Thank you, Maldir. So uh, now maybe a question for all of you is, could any of you provide an example when a male person in a, a Kazakh or Kyrgyz context is being targeted by the Uyad culture, excuse me? Um, yeah, I'll start. Um, so um, just answer. I think, yeah, those examples are like, easy to find because Yacht is not only targeted at women, of course, but I think uh, a large part of it is this gender norms and gender social socialization and what traditionally we expect from women and men, like women to be obedient and submissive and quiet and men to be dominant and aggressive. And if a man is not like that, then you are a kabluchnik, like you are uh, like following the directions of your wife or your girlfriend or whoever, if you like, you're too soft, not aggressive or, so I think it's not that hard to find uh, examples of, so th that's one of the forms of targeting men, like, demanding them to be in accordance with the requirements of a patriarchal society. Yeah, maybe somebody else can add more. Yeah, anybody wants to add anything? Yeah, I could say yeah. a few things. Yeah, sure. go ahead, Maria. Great. Um, yeah, I suppose um, in my chapter, I talk about uh, non-heterosexual men or cisgender identifying men. And uh, that's very much comes in into what Karol Das just pointed out. So it's directly violating the traditional sort of norms around gender identity. So uh, that comes in from various sides. And I, I cite an example of mostly family members uh, being the shaming agents uh, within my chapter. So, for example, a narrative of Bolat who came out to uh, his parents and um, he describes, yeah, his his father, his mother being very much ashamed, communicating that feeling ashamed, and then very much policing their uh, son's expression of um, non-heteronormativity. Uh, Bolat uh, self-identifies as activist, and he sometimes would wear LGBT symbolic, uh, such as, you know, flags, uh, LGBT flag, or things like that. And um, his family would very much well, sort of uh, look that he doesn't do that, that he doesn't post on social media, anything related to being non-heterosexual. And uh, there I described, there is a quote there that his father very much threatens him physically and um, also psychologically to say that that you will see uh, there will be violence, there will be, um, so you have to comply with uh, our demands for you to stay uh, invisible, to not express um, your queerness outside. Thank you. Jibek, did you want to say anything? Uh, yes, I just okay. wanted to add Please. to Karla Ghesh and Maria that in our culture, there is some norms how men should behave. Like they have to be masculine, they have to be strong, like men don't, don't cry, something like that. And if you don't fit this one, it's uyat. Like, yeah, they're ashamed for that. Like, why are you crying as if you are a woman? So they could uh, hear if they would be crying. And in my research also, like my chapter also, it is uh, my uh, like uh, goal was like mm, oriented to uh, women mostly. And there is also the case that uh, if son is not giving their own uh, 
child to his own parents and it, it means that he is not caring for his own parents and it's like uh in my opinion it's uh, more difficult to uh men as well uh, as a woman because uh they are between like their own child and their own parents so it is so difficult and it needs more research i guess so yeah thank you thank you Jibek. So, uh, a next question is, uh, I mean, Moldir mentions that people who spend some time abroad are less likely to uh, be exposed to the acceptance of shame. So, the question here to Moldir, but to, I mean, any of our panelists would be, what is the impact of migration on, uh, on the UIAD? For example, do the difficult working conditions of migrants in Russia, uh, which in a way, help to strengthen ties between migrants within a network contribute to the UYAT or does remoteness the experience of living abroad, not only in Russia, but for example, in Turkey or in Europe, uh, is that a factor of resistance to UYAT? So yes, what is the impact of migration and uh, of uh, staying abroad for a while on the UYAT? Uh, can I answer the question, please? Of course. Thank you. So I think the factor of uh, living abroad, especially in the Western countries, um, makes a drastic change on people's perception of Yat in Kazakhstan. So, for example, uh, the focus groups I've done in terms of my thesis, uh, uh, so I've done focus groups among uh, 30 women of young uh, mothers of young children, and uh, we were discussing about the traditional gender roles. So and a few of them shared with me that in, while in Kazakhstan, um, so for example, their husbands, they uh, were abiding by the social norms and whereas abroad after having lived abroad for some time, um, so their perceptions of the traditional male roles have changed. So they could just take, you know, the avoyska, you know, these textile bags and they go to the grocery shopping, which was, which way they couldn't do before they had uh, living, they had the experience of living abroad. So I think it plays a quite uh, strong role. So when you're uh, surrounded by people who don't know you, who don't know your status or your nationality, right? So you are more feel liberated to break those traditional gender social norms. So I think it's plays a huge factor and this factor is under research, I think. Uh, thank you. Anyone else wants to add anything on that? Or we can move to the next uh, next question. So, <clears throat> uh, a question to Carly Gash. Uh, so, during focus group, your focus group discussion with parents, did some of them have negative attitudes toward comprehensive sexual education, education since it might include topics on non-heteronormative no norms of sexual behavior? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for the question. Uh, Alia. Yes, um, I think while we were discussing, as we discussed, because there is this uh, shared by many people, there is this um, um, superstition or belief that sexuality education is teaching children how to have sex, which is not at all true. It is uh, informing or teaching children about like their own body, how it's going to grow and develop during puberty and like what processes are going there. And then it's about your relationships, how to build healthy relationships, how to like explaining what is at least in my broad understanding of comprehensive sexuality education, like what, what is love, what is uh, friendship, what is respect, what are my boundaries, like personal boundaries, how I can protect them and how uh, I can um, avoid uh, violating some uh, other people's boundaries. So this all is comprehensive sexuality education and also about gender roles, like deconstructing them and talking about them. And uh, yes, of course it includes sexuality or sexual orientation and some people expressed, some parents expressed uh, a negative attitude to, to uh, non-heteronormative relationships. Because, um, yeah, a couple of people said that, like, yes, this is like, it's coming from the West, all these 
gay people, they should just live in their own country on some island. Like, I don't want my child to be exposed to that. Or one parent said that when we, I was walking with my little son, we saw a couple of guys like walking in front of us, holding hands. And I told them, why are you demonstrating to us like your relationships, your affections, keep it to yourself. And yes, there is this attitude, but as, as we discussed, like the essence and the purpose of sexuality education, they re were realizing that it actually, the goal of it is to protect their children, to equip them with tools and skills and knowledge to protect themselves. So I think parents understand more or less what sexuality education is if you talk to them and if you explain it to them, but then they are not, um, necessarily ready to still it because it's like it's very difficult it's this internal barrier for you to discuss this very sensitive issues with your children and if you've never done that then it's hard to start and very often they choose to kind of outsource it and that's why I think they like the idea of this being a part of their education because somebody else if they are competent they can talk to their children about this difficult uh, topics like one of the mothers from Shimken was like, Oh, my son came one day from school and asked me, like, you told me that before you told me that I, I was born out of your like belly button, but my classmates told me the truth, like how children are born. Is that true or not? And she was like, I just laughed and said, It's too early for you to know, I'll tell you later. But it's like he already knows, and by this attitude like laughing it off and not telling him the truth. You are just like turning your son away and he will not come to you the next time with a question or questions like that. So yeah, I went too long. I hope I answered the question. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Kelly Gash. And actually there's another question for you, but our other panelists can, uh, can answer too. But the question to you is, did any one of your uh, interviewees believe that the introduction of a, compre of a comprehensive sexual education curriculum in Kazakhstan school is a concept of the liberal West? Uh, yeah, um, like uh, I just mentioned briefly that some of them think, and once even like, not during uh, the focus groups one time we were like uh, going to several cities in Kazakhstan with lectures for parents uh, talking about sexuality education and in Karaganda a woman attended who actually started a petition that uh, like when I looked it up last May it had or March it had 32,000 like Chinese. It was against sexuality education, like against our health ministry. And she believes, and we are used to, we have the stereotype, right, that religious people, but mostly like Muslims, they're against uh, sexuality education and anything related to knowing about this. But that woman was a Christian woman. And I think it, it's like this large right wing uh, movement that also like Maybe to us it comes from Russia and their church, like, uh, but it started, I think, earlier. So <laughs> answering your question, yes, there are some people or a lot of people who think that, yes, it's all this rotten West who wants to destroy our values. But once people start discussing the issue and actually knowing and uh, learning about the true purpose of it, then they share uh, they share, they share my opinion, more or less, that it is needed, that children need sexuality education, but they don't necessarily want to be the ones providing it. All right, thank you very much, Gary Gash. Uh, next question is for Ellen. Uh, in political arena, do women politicians have power to criticize or shame others? And if yes, is it women to women or women to men? Yeah, uh, thank you um, for the question, uh, Don Ochan. Um, uh, I haven't seen, I haven't come across instances where women were shaming others. Um, I mean, they are, I guess there's a matter of numbers. Uh, they are a lot fewer, <laughs> fewer female politicians uh, and they tend not to have um, that much power. 
um, uh, and they make uh, very few, um, they hold very few ministers, yeah, for instance. And as I mentioned, um, there are very high level politicians who normally are allowed to shame others. Um, so I don't think um, it would have been interesting. I haven't come across, for instance, Dariga Nazarbayeva, yeah, who was probably the most powerful female politician in Kazakhstan, and now she's out, a bit out, out of uh, the public uh, picture. Uh, but um, but I haven't come across a woman doing that. Uh, and I also haven't come across women being shamed uh, as well. So that's also interesting is like shame is, um, uh, that might answer the, the one of the first questions. Yeah. So um, men uh, can be shamed uh, publicly uh, in, the pub in the political sphere, but uh, women tend not to be. Uh, so that's also, but that would be an interesting follow-up to the, to the, the, the uh, to the study as well. Thank you. Another question is on the de-shaming process. So uh, globalization helps to overcome the concept of yet, but mainly in large cities. So how do you think the shaming process could be addressed in rural areas? Uh, thank you for the question. So I think uh, one of the most powerful tools of uh, contributing to the de-shaming process in rural areas among young people is through the popular, popular culture. So as we could see uh, from the concerts that had been um, um, held by uh, Q-pop group 91. So we can see the trend of for example, five years ago, I think most of us, half, most, half of the contracts have been canceled around the Kazakhstan, especially in the most uh, uh, perceived as conservative um, cities, such as in Southern or Western regions, but we could see the trend of changing to the positive side in terms of the detraditionalization. De so I've been following them. Um, so I think this year, so the cities that has, can has been canceled in the concerts actually it, it, it took place there. So we could see that uh, by the crowds of young people and their, Kazakh speaking people from rural areas, they've been gathering at the oblast centers to see this concert. So yes, I could see one of the uh, powerful tools is this through popular culture. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, anyone wants to add anything on that? Okay, we have maybe just two minutes left. Uh, uh, before the end of this event, unfortunately, it's, very, it's going very quickly, but I'd like to uh, maybe bring uh, the UIAT in a more historical perspective. Uh, I mean, your book focuses on the contemporary uh, period, which is uh, absolutely uh, legitimate. But uh, let me bring the Soviet uh, period here. Could any of you elaborate on the one hand, what was the impact of the Soviet regime on the UIAT? Did the regime try to limit the policy of shame, or on the country did it exploit it? And did the, did the end of the Soviet regime lead to a strong evolution in the practice perception of shame in Central Asia? Did you identify some changes, some significant changes since the fall of the Soviet regime? Um, maybe I can start um, with a short answer um, uh, from from my case. Um, I think um, the the public shaming was also a practice under uh, under the Soviet Union. Yeah. So if you were not a good patriot, um, you could be shamed publicly. So those um, and uh, those two sort of uh, practices uh, mingled. Yeah. Uh, quite well, uh, we could say. Um, and uh, in terms of gender, I think uh, it was it has been studied it's extensively how the Soviet Union imposed a very heteronormative gender order, and um, and the, the 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 talking about sexuality was extremely um, uh, taboo. Yeah. So as I said, sex and yet, yeah, everyone knows this joke in the former Soviet Union. Uh, so sexuality. Uh, yeah, discussions about sexuality were frowned upon. Uh, so that would uh, that would be my my answer uh, in uh, two minutes. <laughs> but uh, I don't know if others uh, want to contribute. Anyone wants to add anything? Yes, Maria, please go ahead. Yes, yes. I suppose uh, very very similar thoughts to what Helen just said. I, in in my findings, Kazakh participants mentioned both. You know, something about shame and uyad. 
And also they spoke about that coming, especially in all the generation from the Soviet values of not discussing sex, of not speaking relationship or, or any private conversations uh, outside of matrimony. Um, so very much, um, I, I suppose I'm in agreement in that the two uh, regulatory strategies in my opinion, very much intertwined and, and, and uh, yeah, reinforce each other in some ways. Uh, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you, Maria. So unfortunately, we need to conclude. I just want to give our panelists the opportunity to add a word, a uh, final word, if, uh, if they wish. Anyone of you wants to add anything? No? Okay. Yes. Your yeah, time. sorry, please, please go ahead. No, yes. I, I was just saying thank you for your time and uh, coming to listen for our presentations. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So yes, unfortunately, we need to conclude. So uh, I would like to thank uh, the uh, panelists, the authors, first for uh, their presentation and uh, the discussion. And second, for the great work on this, again, understudied and so uh, important topic. I very strongly recommend uh, our audience to read this book. So again, entitled Uyat and the Culture of Shame in Central Asia, published by Pelgrave Macmillan. It's really a strong uh, contribution to understand uh, Central Asian society. And this book reopens really many new research question on what will need uh, to be to be explored. Uh, I would also like to thank our audience, of course, for being with us today for all the questions. It's very interesting discussions, and uh, we look forward to having you again in our upcoming Central Asia Prime seminar. So thank you very, very much all. Uh, goodbye. Have a great day or have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Bye. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you, Helen. Thank you.